uh, administrators and that sort of thing a fair, fair wage. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we have time for this evening. Professor Williams, thank you very much again. On behalf okay. of Australia's 21st Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, was farewelled this week at a state memorial service at the Sydney Town Hall. Evocative of his life and times, great love and dedication to his country. Attended by past and present political leaders, the service commemorated a man who left a legacy of unprecedented change in Australian politics. There was a different Australia afterwards. See the full replay this Sunday on APAC, Australia's public affairs channel. Challenges, innovations, solutions. This is APAC, Australia's public affairs channel. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I, um, can I get proceedings underway and extend a very warm welcome to everybody in the room to the 2014 Sir Paul Hasluck Foundation Annual Lecture. Welcome to the Ian Hanger Recital Hall here of the Queensland Conservatorium, Griffith University. My name is Martin Betts, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University and I'm del delighted to welcome you all here tonight. Can I be begin with a few acknowledgements? I'd like to acknowledge our guest speaker, Noel Pearson, Mr Noel Pearson. The Honourable Nicholas Hasluck, AM, son of Sir Paul Hasluck and his wife, Mrs Sally Ann Hasluck. Senator Brett Mason, Chairman and Host Director of the Sir Paul Hasluck Foundation and to other directors and the CEO of the Sir Paul Hasluck Foundation, welcome one and all. Can I also acknowledge current and former members of Parliament, the current and former members of the Judiciary, of which there are many of both in the room tonight, and other distinguished acad academics and ladies and gentlemen. I'd also like to begin very appropriately um, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting tonight, pay my respect to elders past, present and future. And I'd like to offer a, a very profound apology from the Vice-Chancellor of Griffith University, Professor Ian O'Connor. Um, as I'm sure many of us are aware that we're just a week away in the run-up to the G20 here in Brisbane, indeed in a location just across the road from this fine building. And this is a very busy time in, in Brisbane, this time of year, and our Vice-Chancellor has um, many uh, engagements this week, and some of them are unfortunately things that he cannot, um, he cannot give up, and this, this event is one that he would very much like to have been here tonight, and he asked me to personally extend his apologies for not being able to be here. We are fortunate to have many distinguished guests here this evening, including two members of Sir Paul Hasluck's family, Mr Nicholas Hasluck and Mrs Sally Ann Hasluck, as I've mentioned. And beyond Senator Brett Mason, I also acknowledge Senators Corey Bernardi, David Bushby, Mitch Fifield and Arthur Sinodonis. And a special welcome to our guest speaker, Mr Noel Pearson. And I guess Noel um, would have to be about the quintessential example of the person who needs no introduction. And his um, heartfelt reflective words that reverberated around the nation yesterday at the memorial service for Gough Whitlam have only added to the sense in which all of us tonight need no introduction to Noel. I might put that in the context of um, this particular event, because in so many ways, Sir Paul Hasluck is a, a very appropriate historical figure to honour as the namesake for this evening's oration. He entered federal politics in the swing to the Menzies Liberal Party in 1949, and within two years was the Minister for Territories. He held this position for the next 12 years and developed what was arguably the Commonwealth Government's first serious attempt to understand the situation of Indigenous Australians and to develop a really serious public policy framework in this area. Hasluck was both a man of his times and ahead of, it, ahead of them and there's no doubt that he approached these matters that we're discussing here tonight with great empathy and from a social justice perspective. Since Sir Paul Hasluck's time a great deal has changed in our nation and in a way that Australia has approached these, the issues affecting Indigenous people. But one could also arg argue strongly that not nearly enough has actually changed in this context, and I feel sure our speaker will have more to say on that point, and about the changes that he has seen, and about the changes he still wants to see. Bringing about change is a function in, in my profession of knowledge and understanding. It's what universities seek to do. It's our business to stimulate debate, 
to shine the light in all corners of our history, but also shine light on contemporary life. And I think there's a general appreciation in our, nature, in our nation and throughout the world of the importance of education and universities in particular. They're important to preserve intellectual freedom and also critical to equality of opportunity. And this belief stands out amongst all the other values that we hold to be important in national life. And Sir Paul Haslock certainly believed in equality of opportunity, where people are judged first and foremost on their worth as human beings. Griffith University has an institutional commitment to equity and social justice that dates from our foundation as a university more than 40 years ago. And our commitment to making a contribution to the communities that we serve is as, is as strong today as it was back then. And it's that is why the university supports events such as this oration here tonight. We invite speakers to challenge us to reflect on the most fundamental issues in human affairs, regardless of national borders. Now, many of the people present here will have known Noel Pearson for many years, and many will have engaged with Noel in robust discussions on matters of the deepest significance in our national life. These matters, in my view, are also of great significance to us all personally. And it's because they're so important to me personally that I'm so looking forward to hearing from Noel tonight. So on behalf of Griffith University and its Vice-Chancellor, I'm very pleased to welcome you to a building on our campus, to this Hasluck oration for 2014. Now I now invite you to join me in welcoming Senator Brett Mason to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Martin, thank you very much. And, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming, particularly before Brisbane enters into a, a, a G20 lockdown next week. Um, on behalf of the directors of the Support Hasluck Foundation, thank you so much for coming to our third annual lecture. And I would like to thank Griffith University and its Vice-Chancellor, Professor Ian O'Connor, and Deputy Vice-Chancellor Professor Martin Betts for their very generous hospitality tonight. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, my fellow directors uh, here tonight set up the foundation over two years ago to honour Sir Paul's contribution to Australian public and intellectual life and to promote and inform conservative thought and debate of key issues facing our nation. The directors were at one, ladies and gentlemen, in their decision that Noel Pearson should be invited to be our guest speaker at the Foundation's third annual lecture, following in the footsteps of John Howard and Sir Peter Cosgrove in years past. And we were absolutely delighted, let me tell you, that Noel so kindly accepted our invitation. And this is because ensuring that Indigenous peoples can fully share in the Australian dream remains perhaps the last great unfinished business of our nation making. Sir Paul Hasluck retained a lifelong interest in the betterment of our Indigenous peoples. He passionately believed that the future for Indigenous Australians, to use Sir Paul's own words, lay within the mainstream through being able to share the same opportunities as all other Australians. This view was then controversial. When he wrote this, Sir Paul was criticised by many and even condemned by some. Uh, Noel Pearson has also not been a stranger to controversy. He wrote a few years ago in the introduction to his first collection of essays, Noel wrote, Freedom for our people will not come as a result of progressive governments giving us back our rights. We will be free when we take back our right to take responsibility. For such seemingly heretical views, Noel too, like Sir Paul Hasluck, was criticised by many and condemned by some. But he is one of the very few people, not just not just in Indigenous affairs, but in Australian public life generally, who enjoys respect 
and admiration right across, right across Australia's political spectrum, both for his work on the ground in Cape York and for his unique contribution to public debate. His unfailing ability to touch minds as well as touch hearts. His stirring tribute to the late Gough Whitlam just yesterday displayed yet again Noel's generosity, his great insight, and dare I say it, great oratory. On behalf of everyone here tonight, I'd like to welcome Noel Pearson, lawyer and activist, director of the Cape York Institute for Policy and Leadership, and one of Australia's most respected public intellectuals, whose life and work are a continuing testament to the central insight of Sir Paul Hasluck's life, that learning and ideas truly matter. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Noel Pearson. Thank you very much, Brett, for that uh, kind welcome. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional owners, and I bring greetings from Cape York Peninsula. I'm very pleased to have been invited by the Hasluck Foundation to deliver this third lecture in his honour. I believe the Foundation has filled a real lacuna in the um, public uh, a recognition of great Australians. I was very surprised that it's come so late in the day, but I pay tribute to the senators who've um, marshalled together with this foundation to honour Sir Paul Hasluck's memory. He was without a doubt a great humanitarian. And uh, he held very tender anxieties for the situation of Aboriginal people at a time when neglect was the prevailing policy. At a I've had the um, opportunity to do a lot of reading in uh, recent weeks and I'm completely struck by the constant campaigning by Sir Paul Hasluck in the uh, early to mid parts of the 20th century, at a time, as I say, when Aboriginal people were very marginal to Australian society and politics. Um, it was the era, as the late W. E. H. Stanner dubbed it, it was the era of the great Australian silence about Aboriginal affairs. And Sir Paul Hasluck was one of those Australians who took it as his duty to highlight the parlous situation facing Aboriginal groups across the country. And I'm very uh, pleased to have been invited by the Foundation to speak about some of the driving ideas that he championed back then um, that are still very much uh, at issue today. I want to acknowledge the Griffith University for their kindness in hosting this event. The university, as my colleague Alan Tudge knows very well, uh, was very kind to the Cape York Institute for Policy and Leadership hosting our organisation as part of the university. And I'm forever grateful for the, for the very good uh, and, and kind uh, relationship that we've had with the university. They really went out of their way to support us um, in our policy venture in Cape York. And I, I would ask that uh, the Vice-Chancellor in particular be once again be reminded of our gratitude for that. I first want to talk about my political orientation. I was genuine when I said yesterday that I had no family tradition in politics. 
When you grow up in an Aboriginal reserve with limited communications with the outside world, and you live in an institution that controls every small detail of the lives of the community members, uh, you have only a very dim awareness of what's going on in the wider Australian community. I knew the Prime Minister's name uh, at the time I was in primary school. Um, I knew the Governor-General's name. I knew the Premier's name, and that was about it. In uh, the elections uh, at, at, in my home community, I think uh, people fairly reflexively voted for uh, the National Party um, because the Lutherans in charge of the institution were very encouraging of that choice. <laughs> but to say that uh, we had any real awareness of the great tribes that were in contest in politics uh, would be to state too much. The orientation that I, I have towards politics is therefore one of native instinct and learning as I went through my life. And, uh, and I want to explain uh, where it is that I come from in relation to what really, when for me, you boil down the great political traditions and philosophies, there's three basically big caps. And it seems to me all politics flow from these three great traditions. Conservatism, liberalism, and socialism. And uh, it was during my time with Alan and we were trying to think through the whole business of, well, if we weren't convinced about the existing paradigm in Indigenous affairs, and we had to go back to first principles, and we had to ask ourselves the question, well, we want our people to advance in the world, to take a better place in the world. How do people do that? How do people prosper in the world? What are the rules of success? What are the avenues for success? How is it that some people come to this country and ascend to a better place? And what can we learn from their experience and about the rules of advancement in the big inexorable pyramid of society? And our answer eventually boiled down to what we call the staircase. It seemed to us that the great pyramid of the world operated via a staircase. And this staircase had three aspects to it. The first aspect was that stairs need strong foundations. Societies that have strong foundations are able to well serve their members. And subgroups, ethnic groups or immigrant groups that have strong foundations in their community set their members up to do well. So we seized on the fact that strong people seem to have strong social and cultural norms. These norms serve people well, social norms, norms of respect for one another in the community, norms of abiding by the law, norms of looking after your children and encouraging them in their life path. And uh, the salient lesson for me was to observe the relative progress of Asian Australians and Asian Americans. How was it that these groups came to this country bereft of any material backing but nevertheless did well? And my observation is that these communities have very strong social norms, strong cultural and social norms that are aimed at the cultivation of young people, 
and children in their formative years to set them up for success. And I suppose I contrasted the Asian experience with that of our own people and that of white Australians generally who kind of give their children a wide latitude in their formative years only to find that a, uh, upon their uh, coming of age their choices collapse to very small parameters. Whereas the young Asians brought up in families that constrained their early development, after they've finished their university degree and developed their capabilities, their choices seem to open up like this. So we were convinced about this idea that the rebuilding of strong social norms was a critical agenda for us. And we came upon this conviction very late in the day, unfortunately. If the opportunities that were available to me had been made available to my parents' generation with the strong norms that existed in our community at that time, then uh, I believe that our people would have embraced opportunity and succeeded. Uh, we came to this conviction about the importance of norms in our community, cultural as much as social, very late in the day when our, our communities had started to crumble and the social problems had started to exponentially grow. I grew up in, in a mission that had not one of our community in jail. In my childhood, there was no hope failed person in prison. And yet today, at any one time, we have several dozen of our young people in jail coming in and out, and the, the problem doesn't seem to dissipate. In fact, the problem continues to grow. The second part of our metaphor in relation to the staircase is the structures underpinning the stairs the support structures, the things that you need to hold the stairs up. And our metaphor really was driven by the insights of the development economist, economist Amartya Sen, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, who talked about the concept of capabilities. And the important point that Sen made, and there are terrific echoes between Sen's idea and Hasluck's idea, that people need capabilities to be able to choose. And Sen said the purpose of public policy was to put people in a position where they could choose lives they have reason to value. That people had the capabilities to choose lives they have reason to value. The important point for me with Sen's insight was that in order to exercise real choice, you needed capabilities. And what emerged for me as a critique of prevailing policy in Indigenous affairs was we were saying that somehow young people who were unhealthy, who were uneducated, who really didn't have the capabilities, were alleged to have some kind of real choice when they didn't. There is no real choice when you don't have capabilities, was Sen's point. And so for Sen, that required social justice, social distribution of opportunity. People need good access provided by government to health, education and infrastructure. That is where we can do good for others in our community. The, the role of government, it seems to me, principally, is that role in providing people with the means to develop their capabilities. Because those of us who are now able to exercise the real power of choice are people whose capabilities have been fully developed. We can now employ the power of choice 
because we have capabilities. The third part of our metaphor seemed to me to be the actual rungs of the stairs themselves. Stairs need to be rational for people to climb them. And quite frankly, people climb stairs because they see something better further up. They're animated to climb stairs. They're motivated for something better. And of course, the eureka moment for our work was to discover that, oh, this is all not just a theory. Real human beings have to walk stairs. And real human beings must be animated to walk stairs. They must have reason to ascend. And the reason why humans are motivated to climb stairs is because they see something a little bit better for themselves and for their children a bit further up the stairs. They see opportunity. They see better prospect. They uh, have a jealous concern about their children having something better, a better education, a better career, to earn more money, to have better possessions. This is what, of course, the liberals call self-interest. And we, it was the eureka moment when I realized that the engine for ascension is self-interest. That is why we all climb. I wake up just as David Hume predicted a long time ago with self-interest at the front of my nose. And show me the human being is, who does not have self-interest at the front of their nose when they wake up in the morning. And of course that self-interest is a power for good. It produces better results for ourselves and our children. And it, my argument ever since I came to that insight is that social justice is really just the sum of a whole lot of individual progress. Yes, social justice does include social provisioning of the infrastructure under the stairs, distributing opportunity to those who do not have it. But a big part of social justice at the end of the day is that people have a better life and more people have a better life. And, as, and, and the greater proportion of society is moving forward. And in order for that to happen, there is no mass elevator available. The illusion in some of my own personal thinking, inherited from my university days, I harboured an illusion that somehow there is a mass elevator in politics, in government. And I, I've, I've dubbed that the great forklift of social justice. <laughs> that somewhere in a warehouse in Canberra, is sitting this massive forklift and all that it requires is an appropriate Prime Minister with the right motivations to fire up the big diesel engine of that forklift and lift us all to a better life. And the world doesn't work like that. There is no mass elevator. Yes, there is mass distribution of opportunity, but there's, that is no guarantee of mass uplift. One of the insights that came out of our metaphor was the idea that, well, capabilities is a bit different from opportunity per se. Naked opportunity from our experience with welfare is not enough. In order for real good and real progress to come out of opportunity, you must add personal responsibility. You, someone has to take advantage of the opportunity and put it into effect. Be it a mother taking her child to the clinic to make sure that she is availed 
of every good medicine that there is. Be it a father sending their children to school without fail. The opportunity of the school is not enough by itself if people don't take personal responsibility for making good on that opportunity. And so we came to very clearly understand that serving out opportunity willy-nilly was not going to produce social progress by itself. Because the sum goes like this. Opportunity plus personal responsibility equals capability. No capabilities will ensue unless someone takes personal responsibility for capitalising on the opportunity. And this was very clear to me when I first went to Vietnam over 25 years ago. And I asked myself the question, what is the difference between the poverty I see here and the poverty I see in Cape York? What is the difference? Well, in Cape York, we have better infrastructure. We have hot water and running sewage. We have good schools, and yet I feel that there was something different about our poverty in Cape York and the poverty in Vietnam. One of my colleagues said, you know, the problem with our communities in Cape York and the whole policy that applies to them is that it just produces an opulent squalor. A state of affairs where even when you dangle big opportunity, you have no guarantee that people will seize it. Whereas if you provided a school 15 kilometres away, in the villages of Vietnam, the parents will be taking every step to make sure their kids are there bright and early to seize opportunity. So we came to be convinced that opportunity alone, without personal responsibility, is no guarantee of progress. You've got to have both. And of course, the idea of personal responsibility is a strongly conservative idea very much attached to conservative philosophy and thinking and therefore anathema to many people who champion opportunity. And so we have a struggle building capabilities when people abjure personal responsibility in favour of just saying, well, it's just a question of distributing opportunity. Policy works well when you add personal responsibility to opportunity. This whole business of self-interest and the motivation for a better life. Of course, the bad press that self-interest gets in popular political discussion is the, the cost of that is borne, in my view, most by the disadvantaged because we, we lose to the benefit of the disadvantaged the most, the only engine. It's not just the most important engine, it really is the only engine of progress. When you say that a disadvantaged person should have no self-interest, you're basically saying they should stay where they are, or indeed that they should further decline that they shouldn't have a better life for themselves. They shouldn't want a better life for themselves. The equation of self-interest with selfishness in too much progressive thinking is a great driver of endemic poverty and ongoing social inequality. And so in our Cape York agenda, we have come to claim back self-interest. I like mothers who are jealous. I like mothers who are jealous for their own children. I like when we dangle a secondary school scholarship and say, listen, there's a chance here. Who wants to back their kids to send them to boarding school? I like it when mothers are banging on the door. 
because they want something better for their children. Because that is the engine of individual progress as families. And of course, the more families that we have that are climbing and claiming a better place for themselves and their children, we will have a slowly lifting community. One of the things we had to overcome in our thinking was the obscuring of families in Indigenous policy. You know, the great criticism of the conflict in Indigenous communities is somehow that, oh, there's too much nepotism, too much favouring of the family. But I, I have a big caution against that because we all know that jealous regard for your own family is, in fact, deployed the right way, a great power. It is the very engine of progress. We should sanctify parents who want something better for their children. Of course, people should be able to pursue something better for themselves and their children through proper channels, not through public means. You know, not by, by taking over um, community and public organisations on behalf of themselves and their children, but rather there should be a space in Indigenous life where the pursuit of your own private interests is welcomed and not only that, sanctioned. And we have no private space. In our communities, we either got to take over public organisations and community organisations in pursuit of our own self-interest, instead of having a private space where we can pursue the interests of ourselves and our children. In communities of Cape York, the private sphere is this big and the public sphere is this big. And it's no wonder we go hunting and gathering in the community and public sphere when we have such limited opportunities for private pursuit. Any functional community that is progressing is a community that has a constrained public space, that has a very large private space. And of course, the third part of it is a very big voluntary space where people contribute to their community not expecting personal reward. Our diagnosis of the problem with our communities is one where the whole dominant sphere is public. And, there's, and, and that public sphere is at odds with private interest. And, uh, and, uh, and certainly, one of the things we've also observed is that what used to be a big voluntary sphere has shrunk. And it's been crowded out largely by the public sphere. What used to be done by the community and the church and the groups um, uh, in, in the mission days um, is now the subject of some government program. And nobody will take action until we get the grant. And so we're about stimulating the growth of those three sectors. And of course, when you move from one to the other, you know the rules change. You know that in the private sphere, you're allowed to go, go hell for leather for something better for yourself. And when you're in the voluntary sphere, you know that you are there to serve your fellow man. And uh, as I say, the difficulty is that... This is fucking bullshit, okay? The... Yeah, well, I, I could answer you in your own terms, but I will decline. Okay. I'd never, I've never claimed to speak on 
behalf of anyone but myself. Every time you open your mouth, you speak, you, you, you are chosen by white people who sit in this audience in power to speak on behalf of black people. Well. You've got no right to do that. Stand there like a big, strong black man. You're not a strong black man. No way in the world. Um, sorry? Okay. Um, no. Yeah. Sorry, can I just bring the house to order, please? Um, the, the, we have a, a public lecture here, uh, the hosted by. Uh, sorry, can you let me finish? Hosted by the university, where we've invited, as I said in my introduction, in the interest of intellectual debate and the, a chance for us to pursue issues of social justice, but with people being given the chance to speak, a speaker to give us a presentation. I ask us all to let that speaker give us a presentation. We will be followed by Q and A when everyone can have a chance to ask him some questions. Please show him some respect. Okay. Staircase is our principal metaphor for how the world works. And uh, it seemed to us that there were peoples who were climbing to a better life. And in fact, the Australian story seemed to be one of earlier generations taking their children up the stairs a few rungs, and then the next generation going up the next rung, and the next generation going up the next rung clutching their children to their breasts. Now, I don't know whether there is an alternative formula to progress than that. I'm just observing how it was that people from the bog holes of Ireland and the coal mines of England came out here and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are now university graduates kind of as a matter of course. And it seemed to me the story is one of generation by generation uplift. And of course, as I say, I see Asian Australians and other groups ascending in the same way. I suppose I abandon the millennial dream that somehow there's a different formula for Indigenous Australians. That somehow there is a different development formula for us. And, and perhaps in the wellspring of the hearts of the wider community, it lay there. But I'm not laying any bets on that. What I am laying bets on is parents wanting something better for their own children and climbing stairs. 
and taking advantage and taking advantage of opportunities that are provided by the wider society to do so. Let me now turn to the question of race, and I'm completely, absolutely struck by the arguments that we have, that I, I have only late to come to. The problematic basis of our inclusion in the citizenship of this country through the 67 referendum, when we were let into the national citizenship via the door of the race power, is an argument that I've only become convinced about in recent years. When I was a member of the expert panel on constitutional recognition, I heard arguments by my colleagues, Indigenous colleagues in particular, about the problematic fact that the basis of our recognition was through the concept of race. And the argument was put to me that is there not just a human race? Why is it that we are proceeding on the assumption that Aboriginal people are somehow members of a distinct race? And why do we have references to race in our constitution? And of course, in our particular case, a great baggage is attached to the idea of race. Because in our history, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were, in fre were frequently treated as if they were members of an inferior race. And that whole history of colonisation and of the first 200 years meant that the idea of race in our constitution is one that is heavily loaded. It is freighted with that history. And I've become very strongly convinced by the argument of my colleagues that one of the principal beneficial things that can be done in terms of constitutional reform is to refer to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the Commonwealth's power to legislate in respect of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples rather than members of a race. So I'm a strong convert to the importance of us putting race behind us. There will always be a need for protection against discrimination purportedly on the basis of race, on the illeg illegitimate grounds of race. But in my view, we need a positive power in the Commonwealth Parliament that seeks to make very clear that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are the subject of legislative power of the Commonwealth, not on the basis of their, uh, uh, their alleged membership of a distinct race, but because they are indigenous peoples of the country. So, rereading um, Sir Paul Hasluck's writings in recent weeks in preparation for this lecture, and I've been particularly assisted by Geoffrey Partington's book, Hasluck versus Coombs, which I first read 18 years ago when it was first published, and I reread recently, I'm completely struck by Sir Paul Hasluck's insight that we should not be referring to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as members of a distinct race. This is an old argument of Sir Paul's. He had the insight that we only gained in this last four years. He held his insight 50 years ago. And he was, uh, in fact, quite prescient in his warning about the 67 referendum that race was the wrong basis for citizenship inclusion. So I'm uh, just absolutely struck that a point that we've reached in the debate about constitutional recognition is a point that Sir Paul Hasluck was championing um, generations ago. I believe 
that abandoning race and putting it behind us is a very important measure for reforming our constitution. The theme of my address this evening really is to talk about the nature of our Commonwealth and to talk about what I believe is the hidden structure of that Commonwealth. The, it seems to me that our country is comprised of three great parts. There is the indigenous heritage. This is an ancient land. People have been here for at least 53,000 years. When the, when the National Museum asked people what was the defining moment in Australia's history, my correction to the Prime Minister's idea that European settlement represented that defining moment was to say, well, what about 53,000 years ago when the first Indigenous peoples walked across the land bridge in Northern Australia? And uh, I urged upon him three ideas that perhaps the Prime Minister could, could arrogate to himself the right to nominate three defining moments. <laughs> And for me, those three defining moments should be the crossing of the land bridge by the first Australians 53,000 plus years ago. Secondly, the coming of the Europeans. And thirdly, at least in my judgment, was probably the abandonment of the white Australia policy by the Holt government. And those three ideas suggest those three important elements to the Australian Commonwealth. Firstly, the Indigenous heritage, the fact that this was a land occupied and owned by an Indigenous people for millennia. This is such a truism and yet we struggle with the idea. The numbers are so immense that it almost means nothing. The idea that a people could possess a continent for tens of thousands of years and have a relationship with it for millennia is one that we as all Australians struggle with. I believe we need to embrace that idea. I speak one of I speak three of the original 300 plus languages that existed on this continent for many thousands of years. I speak Gugu Yemidir, the language of my father. I speak Gugu Yalanji, the language of my mother. And I learned at the feet of my great old friend, now deceased, Orwanjan of Barrow Point on Eastern Cape York Peninsula. He was literally the last speaker of his language. The only other speakers are two linguists, one in America and one in Adelaide. So those two linguists plus myself are now the only remaining speakers of Orwangian's language. And I learned to speak that language as a university student as a completely intellectual exercise. And my friend wanted me to learn. He wanted someone to continue with the knowledge that was attached to his country. I want to urge on conservative Australians in particular that this aspect of our identity as a nation and our constitution as a commonwealth is a very critical part of what Australia is. I estimate that perhaps less than 5%, and probably that's an overestimation, but for all of the Wagga Waggas and Canberras and Coolums and Indurupillis, <laughs> for all of the ones that are known to have ancient provenance, 
it only represents a small tip of the iceberg of the named places of Australia. If you go to my country, there are hundreds of names. You go to Orokun on Western Cape York Peninsula, there is a named site, a place name every hundred metres. This mangrove outcrop, this swamp, this sand hill, this rock might have a name. And we do ourselves a great injustice, I believe, when we fail to bring to relief that recognition that our country is a named continent. And the business of naming that continent is one uh, that is a task that still lies before us. I know Sir Paul Hasluck was an advocate and a participant in the process of increasing recognition of Aboriginal place names. But it is an unfinished task. And, uh, and at the end of the day, the future of Australia will be one where the indigenous heritage of the country, the languages, the places, the stories, is a heritage that will be owned by all Australians. It will become the heritage of all Australians. And young, Asian, European, descended Australians will one day own the original cultures and heritage of this country as part of their heritage as well. The second aspect of constitutional recognition is about whether we as a nation can come to terms with the relationship between the colonisers and the indigenous peoples that pre-existed the nation. Anthropologists estimate that perhaps across the planet there are between seven and 10,000 distinct peoples, people with distinct cultures and with a distinct connection with territory indigenous peoples, many, some of them nomadic, but many of them long connected with a place on the planet. And these seven to 10,000 peoples in their own way are all agitating for recognition of their identity, of their languages, of their rituals, of their heritage, of their traditions. And across the world, a lot of historical and ongoing conflict is centered on that very question. And the world has tried to work out how is it that we can settle some of the disputations about this when we only have 200 nations and when there's been a lot of history and there's been a lot of layers of history. So there's kind of three options in my view. How do you contend with a world that has 7,000 distinct peoples and only 200 nation states? Well, first option, keep denying the distinctness of those peoples. Keep insisting that the 7,000 peoples abandon their dreams and abandon their identity in favour of fitting in to one of the 200. That's option number one. Option number two is one that says, oh, well, all of those 7,000 are entitled to separate, to form their own nation. And uh, the, the idea is that there should be further fragmentation of nation states in recognition of their distinct claims. Now imagine a world that chose option two as the path forward. The third option, it seems to me, and I believe in relation to the second, that we've come to a point in history where there's probably going to be less than a handful of new nations. 
the, the appetite for further fragmentation is basically exhausted. The historical complexities of layers of history and, and migration and colonization has led to a more complicated world. And fragmentation has reached the end of history. The third option, therefore, is one that I obviously counsel as the preferred approach, and that is recognition and reconciliation within the nation. There are numbers of my people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, who reject the idea that we are part of the Australian nation. I am, quite honestly, an Australian. I believe in a single Commonwealth. But what I seek is recognition and reconciliation within the life of the nation. And I would contend that basically the majority of our people seek a better place in this their own country. I, I know I could be much more palatable in, in suggesting that perhaps I'm still harbouring another option than that, but I have to be honest. My view is that we ought to be recognised as an Indigenous people within the nation that was formed on our land. And we should occupy a rightful place in that country. But the idea of separatism and fragmentation, to my mind, is a futile idea. The claims of Indigenous people of alienation and dissatisfaction are valid claims. They have a root in history and they still have power in the present. I can't really win an argument with Indigenous peoples by saying, listen, you should be satisfied with what we got in this country. That is not an argument that I can sustain because they are right not to be satisfied. But my argument is this, that there is no future in option number one and there is no future in option number two and we have before us the real chance of fashioning a real accommodation within the life of the nation where Indigenous peoples are unequivocally equal citizens in the sense envisaged by Sir Paul Hasluck, but we are also recognised as Indigenous peoples of the land with an ancient heritage and uh, a, a range of uh, recognition that is appropriate to our Indigenous status. Now, the achievement of that vision has got to contend with one argument, and that argument is that, well, isn't indigeneity just a revival in another form of the idea of race that you're trying to get rid of? And I would argue, no, indigeneity is not race. It is the recognition that there are peoples on the planet who have a pre-existing relationship with the nation and with the country and with the territory. There are white people who are indigenous across the planet. There are Europeans and English people who are indigenous. It is just that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are the indigenes of this place. And it is not a question of race to afford recognition to that. Finally, let me turn to the question of assimilation. And it is probably in this aspect of Sir Paul Hasluck's intellectual and policy uh, uh, legacy that I believe we ought to commence a uh, very important discussion. I obviously 
don't agree with the idea of assimilation. But I understand the power of Sir Paul Haslock's arguments at the time. And in my view, I think the, the argument that is most fruitful to explore is one where I don't think we ought to separate out cultural assimilation from another form of assimilation. Because cultural assimilation is anathema. For me and for Indigenous Australians that I know, the idea of cultural assimilation is something that is resisted. We do not want to lose our identity and our language and our culture. We want to be recognised for our differences as well as our commonality with other Australians. So assimilation is the wrong idea. But in my view, the, there is a sense in which successful nations and societies assimilate around an idea. And in my view, that idea is the Enlightenment. And conservatives should stop insisting that minorities and ethnic groups and indigenous peoples and migrants, conservatives should stop e insisting on cultural assimilation. People should make their own choices about the extent to which they evolve or abandon culture. One thing that should be insisted upon, perhaps, is the idea that we all embrace the ideas of the Enlightenment. And I want to read a thought I had in a previous quarterly essay where I started to make the beginnings of that suggestion. And I was reflecting on the tremendous contribution of W.E.H. Stanner to my thinking about the place of Indigenous people in this country. And I said this, Stanner's hope was that Aboriginal people would be able to keep that which makes us who we are. Land rights was part of the necessary answer to this hope. It was not the wrong agenda. It was a necessary but by itself insufficient basis for the achievement of those hopes held in the past which failed to be fulfilled. Stanner's questions were and still are right, although what he may have thought where their answers must be reconsidered. I will chance my arm and say one thing about where Stanner's thinking requires crucial amendment. It concerns the place of the Enlightenment in Aboriginal ontology. The Enlightenment was not the Enlightenment was not and is not at its core a European illumination. It is a human illumination. Its origins in Europe should not blind us to its human meaning and implications. The Enlightenment forced the Europeans to change their societies and cultures in fundamental ways. It forced societies and cultures beyond Europe to make the same change. The Enlightenment never mandated deracination or ethnic or religious assimilation or cleansing. All societies that have made this change have left space enough for religion and for social and cultural diversity. Darwin's Rottweiler, Richard Dawkins, is entitled to his argument that the Enlightenment and God are incompatible. But the world over, wherever the Enlightenment has shone its sometimes dim, sometimes bright light, 
social, cultural and religious mystery and idiosyncrasy remain and flourish. These societies split their personalities, allowing unto God, Voltaire and the abiding spirits of the ancestors what are theirs. Radical hope for the future of Aboriginal Australia, which honours the dreams of Stanna and Dermagam, if not in the way that they imagined it, nor perhaps in the way we imagine it, will require the bringing together of the Enlightenment and Aboriginal culture. This reconciliation is not of necessity assimilation. Just ask the Jews. The education of our children in both traditions at the highest level of effort, ambition and excellence that we can muster is, I have no doubt, fundamental to this hope. If our hopes are for our children, then we must take charge of their education. So that's the beginning of my suggestion that perhaps, and I'm not even sure whether we need to change the name from assimilation, but if assimilation is still a, a valid idea, then I would argue that it is in relation to the Enlightenment, not in relation to English culture. The difficulty we have, of course, is that English culture and the Enlightenment are conflated together. They're assumed to be one and the same thing because the correspondence between much of what we understand to be British culture and the Enlightenment, there's a great deal of overlap. What I would urge conservatives to understand is that think of English culture as one thing and the Enlightenment as a human thing not owned by Englishmen. The Enlightenment is a world heritage. It is the consequence of developments in world culture and understanding. And uh, might I say that Englishmen don't have a monopoly over it. Finally, I want to thank once again the idea that um, uh, the Hasluck Foundation had to um, invite me to deliver this third oration. I have a very strong view that, and, and, and Geoffrey Partington's book, I, I read it 18 years ago, and I have to say I, I really enjoyed reading it a second time around. It is, it is a really good um, uh, illumination of um, Sir Paul Hasluck's legacy and his thinking. And of course, the contest he has in this book is between uh, Nugget Coombs and Sir Paul as two great public figures in Australia. Of course, he's, he's, he's got Sir Paul in um, um, as, uh, as the view that he champions. Um, but one of the things Partington says in this book is that, you know, how, how convergent some of the thinking is, but degrees are very important. You know, emphasis and degrees uh, between these uh, opposing views um, become very decisive. And this is the way I think about things as well. There's a fine line between a right idea and a wrong idea. You know, the, the gulf between bad and good ideas is not large. There are fine lines between wrong thinking and right thinking. And, uh, and the, the trick is in that, in that dialectical process um, to understand that there is merit on both sides. There's force on both sides of an argument. And, and when, we, when we search out the synthesis, um, that search is about understanding that, well, actually, between, and I would say the, the dialectic is not between Hasluck and Coombs, it's really Hasluck and Stanner. And uh, uh, though Stanner wasn't a, 
a public policy figure like Nugget Coombs. Intellectually, my view is that Stanner and Hasluck are the two views that need to be synthesised. And, and I think the, the respect in which Hasluck's view should amend Stanner's view is in relation to this matter of the Enlightenment. It's rights and responsibilities. How do we get that right? And there's never a 50-50 in this. My own theory about dialectics, it's always 51-49 or the other way around. Um, and and I, I, I'll leave the scorecard for the audience to work out whether it's 51 Hasluck's way and 49 Stanner's way. Finally, this is the way I see Paul Keating and John Howard. It's the great dialectical struggle between two important positions, between the rights championed by Keating and the responsibilities agenda championed by Howard. They are both the right ideas. And if indigenous policy is going to come to the right kind of synthesis, in my view, that synthesis lies in indigenous peoples having the right to take responsibility. Thank you. Discussion, debate, democracy. This is APAC, Australia's public affairs channel.